Case Western Reserve University's Great Thinkers series proudly presents the Origins Science Scholars Program. These lectures are presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, with the generous support of Richard Morrison and the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Media Vision, and WVIZ PBS and 90.3 WCPN IdeaStream. Welcome to the Origins Science Scholars Program, a series of talks on current research topics in origin sciences. Hello, my name is Glenn Starkman, Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins, and I'm pleased to serve as your host for this series. The talk you're about to watch is entitled Mars, Meteorites, and Microbes, a skeptic's update on the continuing search for life on Mars. In this talk, Ralph Harvey, Associate Professor of Geological Sciences at Case Western Reserve University and a Fellow of the Institute for the Science of Origins, will tell you about the search for life on Mars. And now, enjoy the talk. Last time I talked about the uh, dramatic effect that life can have on the history of a planet using Earth as an example. And what we're going to do today is extend your knowledge a little bit now and hopefully using the base of what you've already uh, discovered, uh, evaluate the question of whether or not Mars has been the abode for life. And we're going to start with a little bit of a thought experiment. So I want you to think of me in elegant, smelly robes. It's 1750. Um, you're all university students. You women all have to leave. Okay, uh, and uh, we are going to have a 1750s intellectual discussion on whether there is life on Mars. And the question, in fact, wouldn't be whether there was life on Mars, it would be how much, because at that time we knew that life was a spontaneously generated uh, part of the universe. And sophisticated experiments like stuffing underwear to plug up a bo glass bottle full of wheat would result in baby mice, okay? So if we go back to that time, it's not the question of whether life had Mars, but what form it took, how much, et cetera. In other words, the assumption was the universe was fecund, it was full of life. Let's jump forward uh, about 150 years to uh, the turn of the last century, the 1900s. During this time frame, there were some uh, very uh, close oppositions of Mars to the Earth. In other words, Mars was as close to the Earth as it ever gets with its eccentric orbit. And so this was also the birth of big telescope astronomy. A lot of attention was put on looking at Mars. And this is uh, one of the main players in the history of uh, the study of life on Mars, Percival Lowell, having a good look uh, through a very large, uh, I think this is the Yerkes Observatory uh, refractor in southern Wisconsin. Um, Percival Lowell was uh, not just an astronomer, he was also a, uh, an instigator, if you will. He was gathering money for these kind of telescopes, and he understood that the more he could dramatize and popularize what he did or what he saw, the better his chances at being recognized and having good funding were for the telescopes. And uh, he fell under the spell of uh, a vision of Mars as crossed by canals. Now, Percival Lowell is not completely to blame for this. Schiaparelli, whose uh, picture this is, had uh, seen them as well. Uh, others had seen them in this time frame, again, at these op oppositions. They were mapping out Mars, and uh, this uh, captured the public attention dramatically. Um, if you're wondering how could they see that stuff, that's a great question. Um, in fact, their maps aren't bad at all. On the, uh, that's my left, on the left side, we have a Hubble Space Telescope view at one of the more recent opposition, so bright, large Mars. And you can see the general pattern of dark areas and, and ochre, brown, orange areas. They're really not that bad. The big difference is those sharp, highly detailed lines that are way below 
the, uh, any kind of resolution or, or sharper, higher resolution than Hubble can see. So you can imagine of how Percival Lowell uh, perceived them. The popular picture was that Mars was an older planet because it was further away from the sun. And again, we're talking about theories from more than 100 years ago, so cut them some slack, okay? The idea was, was that the sun was dimming. They didn't know about nucleosynthesis and nuclear fusion at this time. The idea was the sun was giving off heat just because it was contracting, and that was going to slow down over time. So the amount of heat that each planet had from the sun was dwindling, uh, and, and the, the, the belt where life could exist and liquid water could exist was moving inward over time. Mars was farther out than we were, so it was naturally an older place, ancient, highly civilized life. And in fact, the canals were thought to be their attempt to preserve water from their poles or polar caps, funnel it down to cities at the, at the uh, equator. Okay? It's self-consistent whether it was erroneous or not. Um, an important part of this story, however, is that it's human nature to use our own human experiences to try and interpret something like that, regardless of whether it makes sense. And with Percival Lowell and Schiaparelli and the others saying they saw something like canals, and it was assumed that they were visible because vegetation was growing along them, okay? That naturally led to more speculation on what Martian life might be like. Edgar Rice Burroughs, one of my favorite authors, wrote A Princess of Mars in this time frame, early 1900s, uh, depicting large six-armed uh, green aliens, and of course there had to be a race of scantily clad, pretty girl humanoid aliens that he could rescue, okay? Um, that's pretty fanciful there. Putting a little more effort into it, H.G. Wells in a publication entitled The Things That Live on Mars from 1908, uh, an artist working with him on that put uh, together that image on the right. And they were trying to put together using a, an image of what life on Mars might be like. It was assumed, of course, there was intelligent life again, and what these people might be like. Um, they have big eyes because there's not as much sunlight at Mars, okay? They're spindly and, and tall, and that's because gravity is lower. They don't need to be big and bulky and, and muscular, okay? Um, and how many of you can pick out the girl aliens? Okay, and I know some of you are thinking about chestal appendages, but look at the bow in her hair. Okay? There's a, oh, there's a unicycle you can't really see very well down there because low gravity lets you ride around on monorail unicycles. And how, that, why we don't have those here in modern era, it's beyond me. Anyway, the point is, these are beautiful illustrations to show us that in a, con, in a, in a setting where data was lacking, we filled it in with our own human experiences. And that's a very dangerous thing when you're trying to answer a question like, what kind of life is there on Mars? Now, at this time, well, one more, one more thing to put into it. On the left here is Percival Lowell's map of Venus. Now, any of you who have ever looked at Venus know it is a featureless white orb. And we talked about Venus last week. It has this huge, thick atmosphere with sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide ice clouds absolutely featureless, blinding white. And he saw canals there too. What was happening is something else. It's a very, very human thing. We all do it all the time. Our, our lives are filled with situations where we just don't get all the data. And in the absence of that data, we try and fill it in using our intuition, using whatever. The problem is, is it can go to the point of seeing things at time. I swear that was my uncle in that car we just passed. Okay? This happens, and Percival Lowell was kind of a victim of that. There's also a simple mechanical reason for this. When he looked at Mars and looked at Venus, he was one of the first individuals to use these really large telescopes. So what he had to do to keep from going blind was to stop them way down. You know, uh, we use f-stops in photography to talk about stopping down the amount of light. And, you know, F-22 would be really stopping it down a lot, you know, to get depth of field and stuff. 
Percival Lowell's pictures were usually, uh, his drawings were usually done when he was observing at F125, F130. And what he was really probably looking at was a reflection of the dirt and imperfections on the surface of his eyeball. All right, let's jump forward about 30 years. And we're jumping forward not only in terms of time, but in terms of what we know about Mars. The, we know by this time Mars is very cold, okay? We know that it has a very thin atmosphere. We have yet to be able to detect any water vapor in that atmosphere. We know it has polar caps, so we know there must be some water ice there. And people are struggling and they've given up on the idea of intelligent life, mainly because there's no lights on the night side of Mars that could be seen. And we've bounced radio waves off Mars and not gotten any answers, okay? So this is, uh, 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 the logic still is great. These are good scientists, okay? These people wanted to figure out what might rule Mars, what kind of animal life. And this, their, their basic thought process is this, and it's, it's impeccable. First, we can't say Mars doesn't have life for some arbitrary reason. Life is on Earth, why not Mars, okay? Whatever that brought life to Earth, brought life to Mars, you're equally probable, okay? And following this logic, the ideal organism would be one that not only is adapted to these cold, dry conditions, but in fact might harbor those resources some organism that alters the environment to suit itself and preserves the material it needs, keep itself warm, give itself more liquid water, give itself food. And of course, you're all thinking of exactly the same organism that they were, the beaver. <laughs> Adapted to the cold, builds little dams to save water, etc. It's easy to laugh at them, okay? But again, this is a natural instinct. They're filling in the gaps in their data with their own human experience. We jump forward to the 60s. We now know that the atmosphere is pure CO2. We see very little oxygen. It's very cold. Here's uh, Werner von Braun and some others are uh, speculating what a trip to Mars might be like. The astronauts have s pressure suits on. And uh, that's perfect, you know, the science is good there. But still, see the carpet of green in the background? People are speculating that this carpet of green is lichens or some kind of photosynthetic life. Because obviously if you've got lots of CO2, life need, you know, photosynthetic life needs that, great. They didn't worry about the fact there was no oxygen coming out of it. That part kind of escaped them. And this persisted into the 60s. Very famous astronomer and planetary uh, astronomer, Slipher, basically said the change in the seasons of Mars is echoed by the waxing and the waning of these green-gray areas. And there is nothing that can explain it except vegetation. Not a single thing elsewhere could possibly explain it. But what we were looking at is global dust storms that happen in the spring and fall on Mars. Mars is a particular place where 30% of the atmosphere freezes out on the winter pole, 30%. That's a pressure difference of about 30%. Your typical hurricane is about 2 or 3% pressure difference from core to outside. As a result, Mars, when spring and summer hit and the CO2 is freezing out of the atmosphere on one pole and thawing out on the other, we have winds that are three, 400 miles an hour. And we have these global dust storms. They weren't looking at the growth of vegetation. They were looking at the obscuration of the natural colorings of Mars. Very quickly, as we get to the break, jump forward to the Viking era. Viking landers, beautiful technological uh, devices, go there. They're covered with life detecting equipment. They find no organic materials whatsoever. And there's still debate over whether it was just the instrument was bad, but it wasn't bad. It was very sensitive. Yet the specter of looking at pictures and figuring out, looking at them as life continues. We've got the face on Mars. You can look that up on the intertubes if you want. We've got uh, my own version of it, Kermit the Frog on Mars. And more recently, Arthur C. Clarke, a renowned science fiction and scientist, science fiction writer and scientist, sees defrosting dunes 
uh, CO2 frost coming off of dunes around the south pole of Mars and says, it's obviously vegetation. There's nothing else it could be. And he's talking about the dendritic patterns you see here. He thinks they're shadows of 300 meter across banyan trees. No, they're defrosting dunes. We have increased our ability to look at Mars by nine orders of magnitude. But you can look at as many orders of magnitude as you want, and if you continue to you know, fill in the remaining data with your own human observations, there's a good chance you'll be wrong. Why is Mars called the red planet if it's covered with CO2 and it has these, uh, uh, you know, it's so cold? Well, Mars is red because of that oxygen which has been freed by photo dissociation of water. Last time we talked about the fact that with no ozone layer, CO2 in the Martian, or H2O, water, when it gets in, as a vapor gets up into the atmosphere, is hit by UV light, the hydrogen and the oxygens break off, and oxygen, being super reactive, bonds with the rocks. So Mars, in fact, has kind of a rusty looking surface. There's a fair amount of iron uh, oxides in the rocks themselves, and they become more heavily oxidized, which produce, you're all familiar with the color of rust. That's really all it is. It's microns worth of material, okay? And, uh, but that's exactly what it is. It's just that oxygen that is present because of the loss, of breakdown of water and the loss of the hydrogen. Mars, to be able to get the uh, additional data that we can't get from uh, uh, rovers, et cetera. Did you all hear that question? He asked if we really need to put a human on Mars uh, to increase or augment the data that we might get from a rover. And that's, that's a topic worthy of a whole hour or two or five debate. In fact, I've been involved in that debate. Um, you know, if I had to summarize it, what I would say is that um, it's easy to measure science in terms of uh, missions per dollar. And there's no question that a robotic mission is lots cheaper than sending a human. I mean, humans are prima donnas. They need water. They need oxygen. They need food. Quit your whining, okay? But the truth is a well-trained scientist can give you more science per minute than any robot is ever going to do, okay? Let me give you, an, and, and particularly if it's, let's say you put a geologist on the surface of Mars who's had 30, 40 years of training, seen all sorts of different environments on Earth, He's going to prioritize the important places to go in the scene in front of him literally within minutes, okay? That's not going to happen by somebody driving a robot, robot with, you know, a joystick on Earth. It's going to be done by committee. It's going to take days. It's only got tunnel vision. It's got a limited set of tools, okay? That intuition, that ability of scientists, engineers, whatever, to look at a scene and pick out what's different, is why we need to send humans to places, okay? And all of you have intuition. You've all learned to trust it. I mean, we've all agree. You walk onto the lot to buy a car, a salesman comes out, he probably knows in 10 seconds whether you're gonna buy something, okay? Or the police officer walks into a bar. He knows whether there's gonna be trouble or not in the first two minutes, you know? It's because of decades and decades of training, the ability to synthesize a wide variety of observations very quickly and pick out what's different or wrong or key that humans have that robots can't deliver on. Because even if they're operating as just a remote geologist for somebody in a lab somewhere, that uh, tunnel between the scientist and the robot constricts their view, constricts their senses, constricts their focus. We're never going to be able to duplicate that, I think, with robots until our robot overloads take over. The, uh, you mentioned that the atmosphere was uh, all CO2, and, I, I'm, and then you said it was very cold, but I, I thought the idea with CO2 was that it uh, created warming. Uh, uh, CO2 in the Martian atmosphere does warm the atmosphere a little bit, but still, uh, it's very thin now. A lot of the CO2 is, has been drawn down in reaction with the rocks and things. So there's not enough CO2 to make it warm by Earth standards, okay? But there is enough to make it warm so that average temperatures 
the average high at the warmest day of summer at the equator is pushing towards freezing, 273, 275 Kelvin, okay? But the atmosphere is still only about 1% that of Earth. It just does, there's not enough mass to give you much greenhouse. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Professor Ralph Harvey of Case Western Reserve University discussing the search for life on Mars. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins. In the first part of his talk, Professor Harvey discussed how scientists over the last few centuries hoping to find evidence of life on Mars consistently discovered it, from canals to vegetation. This despite the fact that it wasn't really there. In the second part, Dr. Harvey will take us on a search for liquid water on Mars. Now we return to the lecture. So we've increased our order of magnitude, in some cases nine orders of magnitude. We still, that doesn't guarantee we can answer this question about life on Mars. And let me give you a very current finding that is, has raised the question of life on Mars again. We have, uh, through a couple of independent means, detected methane in the atmosphere of Mars over the last five years. And methane uh, is a gas that is reactive like oxygen. Its average lifetime on Mars is only going to be a few hundred years, tops. So if it's primordial methane from the birth of Mars, it should be long gone, yet there it is. Parts per billion, not very much, but something's producing methane on the moon, or on Mars, and of course, biology is one of the prime suspects. It is the prime suspect according to a lot of public uh, perception. Well, we're gonna go back to methane in a little while, but I wanna close this section where we talk about human, putting human values, filling in holes with our own human experiences and what potentially wrong with this. To go back to another famous astronomer from that turn of the last century. This is Barnard of Barnard Star fame. And I think, though I'm not sure, this is the quote that led to the phrase castles in the air. Because basically, to paraphrase him, he says, look, it's just human nature. You get a little bit of data and you want to build on it and you want to build on it. Our curiosity is what drives us to look at Mars in the first place. We can't fault it, but we need to learn to control it. All right. So now, very quickly, uh, a little bit of addition to your knowledge of Mars, some of which you got last week. If we want to understand the potential for Mars to have uh, life, let's focus for a little while on just the presence of liquid water. And again, the question has never been, is there water? We know there's, there is a water budget on Mars. It's how much and for how long was it liquid? Very early in Mars's history, we see beautiful dendritic networks like these, branching networks, which clearly represent the flow of fluids, presumably water, across the surface. They all go downhill. They go into basins like this one here. In many cases, the end of these channels, like this one, produce deltas. And those deltas uh, are a geological formation that can only happen if you have a river flowing into standing water. You don't get a delta like this unless this crater, Jezero crater, was full of water when that, lake, when that river was running. There's no other way to do it. <clears throat> but how much water and for how long? In fact, these kinds of features are only in some of the very oldest terrains of Mars. You can see a lot of little craters superimposed on this scene. Those are a proxy for the passage of enormous amounts of time. There are some that speculate as to whether Mars had a global ocean. Mars has a southern highlands, which is old, some volcanoes here poking up, and this northern uh, lowlands is a smooth, uh, low plain. And a lot of people have said, oh, maybe that was once a big ocean on Mars. Another view of it right there, the difference between the north and south of Mars. Part of this problem with a belief in an ocean on Mars is because of the color scheme. You fill in those lowlands with something blue and people immediately associate it with water. This is another example where someone was carefully tracing what looks like a bench that might correspond to an ancient sea level. And they filled in the lower parts with this blue wavy stuff. Hint, hint. Okay? 
The problem is if you try and follow these uh, supposed sea levels around on Mars, from one place on Mars to another a few hundred kilometers away, they can be as much as a kilometer in elevation different. There's no way they can be a sea level. Sea level is sea level, it's flat, same elevation wherever it is. They've got to represent something else. What that probably is, is the fact that those northern plains now are composed of huge amounts of smooth, runny lava. This is an oblique photo from a stereo camera, and this smooth stuff here is lava flows. A lot of the history of those northern plains has been erased, and um, it's easy to fool ourselves into thinking because it's flat and, and has fewer craters that it represents, you know, big piles of sediment like in an ocean. But the truth is it's been paved over by volcanoes. The volcanoes on Mars have filled in the lowest spots. There is liquid water that is presumably leaking out of cliff faces in craters on Mars. And about every year or so now we see more and more evidence of this. We see gullies forming, particularly on slopes where uh, water ice might build up during the Martian winter and then thaw out during the Martian summer. And we've caught, by looking at pictures of similar areas, you know, five, six years apart, changes in the terrain that suggest this is going on today. But what this signifies is a small amount of ephemeral snow or ice kind of on a hillside melting away, kind of like the stuff that piles up on the edge of the parking lot and then is still here in Cleveland in July. Okay. We do see evidence of water on Mars that's almost global. In this picture, again, they made the water-rich areas blue. I wonder why. Okay. This is actually based on uh, neutron absorption by water, presumably in the crust. Gamma rays come into the crust, uh, excite neutrons to go flying around. And in these areas, less neutrons come out. Therefore, something's capturing them. And the assumption is that it's hydrogen, which is assumed to be part of water. A lot of assumptions there, but not, not unbelievable. Most of this, however, is in the form of pattern ground here, which is basically permafrost, OK? There's, very, there, there's virtually no sign of any liquid that isn't momentary right now on Mars. That said, Mars has a very odd orbit, OK? Its tilt goes from almost perfectly vertical to, the, to its orbit, where both poles are illuminated at once to being highly inclined, kind of, and its, its inclination right now is very, or excuse me, its obliquity right now is very much like the Earth's, about 23 degrees. But it also has an orbit itself that tilts up and down, so that enhances the effect of this obliquity. And then it's also eccentric. The oval that represents its orbit has the sun at one point, and it moves around. So we've got a lot of wobbles, and the result is, that Mars goes through cycles that are pretty dramatic with obliquities that go from basically zero up to almost 50 degrees. During those changes, uh, particularly when you're at low obliquity, a lot of the atmosphere is going to freeze out. And that's because these areas near the poles are never getting full sunlight. Okay? On the other hand, when obliquity is high, every, sprint, every summer, every winter, you go from utter darkness to full illumination. And that allows the volatiles to keep moving. So there are periods on Mars where the atmosphere is thicker, it's a little bit warmer, et cetera. But they're followed on orders of tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years by total freeze outs. Well, we do have another ground truth source of information for our understanding of water on Mars and its history. This is the Martian meteorites. We've got about three dozen meteorites that we believe were knocked off Mars by impacts, and the Earth has collected some small portion of that debris. They are, in effect, not just samples of the rocks of Mars, but because they're from Mars, they act like witness plates. And we can, use, we can try and read them, if you will, to understand how often they've encountered liquid water, how often they've experienced weathering, et cetera. You're all going to ask me how we know they're from Mars, so let me get that out of the way. Some of these rocks have trapped glass in them, and glass is simply frozen liquid. The impact that knocks them off Mars melts part of the rock, and then it chills immediately as it's flying out into space, and the Earth picks some of that up. Well, enterprising scientists took apart that glass to look at the atmosphere trapped in it, and what they found was beautiful one-for-one -one correspondence 
with the Martian atmosphere sniffed out by the Viking landers. And because atmospheres from planet to planet, particularly in terms of these noble gases like xenon, krypton, argon, neon, et cetera, vary dramatically in these trace unreactive gases, this can't be a mistake. There's no way that, you know, this could come from anywhere but Mars. So we're going to look at three main types of Mars meteorites and what kind of weathering products we can find within them. Things, secondary minerals, minerals that are a result of the original volcanic rock, and all of these are volcanic, minerals that have resulted as they've reacted with moisture. When we look at the youngest and most abundant class of these meteorites, there are about 18 or 20 of them called the Shergatites, they go back from just 160 million years ago to about 750 million years ago. They show almost zero weathering. These things are as fresh as a rock right out of the volcano in Hawaii. In fact, if you take a typical volcanic rock on Earth and leave it outside for a couple of weeks, it shows more weathering products than these do. The next oldest group go back about three billion years. There's a bunch of them. There's about six of them. They all come from the same hole in Mars. They have a very, very little bit of weathering in them, a little bit more. But again, it's the kind of stuff you would see maybe on that rock from Hawaii that set out for a few weeks or a month. Very, very little weathering products. We do have one Mars rock that dates back four billion years. This says four and a half. That, this is a, a slightly old slide. It actually contains fairly abundant weathering products. About 1% of it is weathering products. This beast, Allen Hills 8401, has within fractures of the rock little orange and black and white pancakes of carbonate minerals growing on the faces of the fractures. It became the topic of immense study once we realized it was from Mars in 1994. And I was heavily involved in its study and I wanted to know how these things formed. Uh, with a bunch of other scientists, we started kind of tearing the rock apart. Um, one of the things we noted was that these growths of carbonate do occur in fractured areas of the rock. Uh, how do I know it's fractured? Well, the rock's all broken up through here. This is a thin section view, just a millimeter or so across. These are chromite grains that used to be kind of soccer ball shaped. And they've been crushed and dragged out as the rock, pieces of the rock moved relative to each other. I looked very carefully at the chemistry of the rock. This is a thousand analysis of different carbonates. And this is uh, three different key carbonates showing me an interesting pattern that I interpreted using earth rocks that combine some volcanic rocks with some carbonate. This is a rock called sagmondite, if you care. And uh, what I found was that the suite of minerals in there and their growth pattern strongly suggested a high temperature reaction, a reaction that had to occur from a fluid that was at least 90% CO2, which fits very well with Mars, and temperatures around 550 degrees uh, Celsius, so really hot. And the best hypothesis I could come up with was something I'll call impact metasomatism. Basically, you have an impact event, crushes the rock, and there's plenty of CO2 around. If it happens near one of the poles, the winter poles, or anywhere there's CO2 frost, basically, it's going to pump hot CO2 rich volatiles through the rock and they'll react. And they turn the original rock, which is volcanic minerals like olivine and pyroxene, into some carbonates. And here's an artist's rendition. I didn't attribute this. I'm sorry. I can't figure out where I got it. It's a beautiful picture. Uh, with some of my grad students, we've tried to read the book of these carbonates very carefully. And what we have found is that over 4 billion years of Martian history, this rock experienced two short-lived wetting events, two in four billion years. The rock was wetted and heated uh, once, and then it was wetted and heated real hot a second time, and then it was done. And most of that happened about four billion years ago. Well, uh, I published uh, the, my first uh, example of these findings on July 4th of 1996. I was a summer faculty fellow at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, um, and uh, 
when my time there was done, which was uh, sort of the second week of July, I put all my stuff in my pickup truck that I confessed to last time and drove home to my mom's house in Wisconsin. And I remember the date very well because uh, it was also the day the movie Independence Day came out. So Martians were on people's minds. What I didn't know was that as I was driving to my family home in Wisconsin from Texas, all HE double toothpicks had broken out because another NASA group from the same place at Johnson Space Center said that that carbonate, they interpreted the carbonate in that rock as containing three clear signs of Martian life. That was 1996, August, and uh, all heck broke loose. Are we ready for questions? Okay, question time. We're going to talk about the details of why they thought there was life there in a minute. Astronomers have been reporting Earth-like planets for a number of years now, but are s somewhat silent on Mars-like planets or Venus-like planets. Uh, have they found many Mars-like planets or Venus-like planets? Uh, the question is, have they found any planets out there that are kind of Mars-like and Venus-like? You've heard the term Earth-like planets a lot, and that's even stretching the definition of what's Earth-like. You know, uh, in fact, the book is still out on that. You can expect hundreds of reports of new extrasolar planets, that is, orbiting stars other than the Earth over the next few years. The Kepler Orbiter Observatory is basically partially designed just to look for those, okay? The catch is, is that almost all of their implications of what size the planets are and what their atmospheres might be, might be like, et cetera, are done kind of by elimination. Um, you see that uh, a star is wobbling and you infer there is another planet there, or you see a, a star that is dimming for a while and then coming back in a regular pattern and you infer a planet is crossing in front of it, okay? And you've got the spectra of the star and then when the dimming is occurring, you look at how different it is and you say, oh, the difference means whatever atmosphere gases there might be, et cetera. Uh, Many, many of those that are reported as Earth-like or you know, within the realm of liquid water, all these kind of things, there are subsidi subsidiary reports, secondary reports that come back and say, oh, that wasn't true at all. So at least from my impression, the jury is still really out on those. There will be Earth-like planets found. There's no doubt about that. We'll see planets that maybe have uh, clear signs of water in their atmospheres, CO2 or whatever. But I think it's too early to, to overinterpret that. And in terms of uh, size of things, it's a stretch to find things that are kind of at the Earth scale. It's much easier to find Jupiters and Neptunes and things. So Venus, Mars kind of things, we're kind of stretching their ability to analyze this stuff. So I think we wait and see is my answer to that. A little bit of a cop out. Considering that we have in our scale a huge amount of water on this planet and that what I've read is the thought is that these came, that came from comets. Um, and I would assume that all the planets were bombarded in the solar system the same way. Uh, there isn't any other evidence of why, you know, other planets aren't just loaded with the water that we have. Well, the, the big issue, that was the main point of, of last week, is that we do see clear signs from the planets where we have real data on the atmospheres and stuff. We see clear signs that m planets lose most of their water very quickly on unless an ozone layer develops to stop the UV light, to absorb the UV light. The Earth did that probably as a result of photosynthetic organisms. Venus, Mars didn't do it, okay? And it may be that simple, that without some source of atomic oxygen leaking in the atmosphere, and in order to get it in the atmosphere, you've got to saturate the rocks, you're never going to have an ozone layer and you're going to lose all your water, no matter how much you start with, because UV from your star is relentless. How do you determine the age of these Martian meteorites? Uh, is it through carbon dating? Uh, the question is how we determine the ages of the Martian meteorites, and it's actually through dating of the minerals in the rocks themselves and dating uh, longer-lived radioactive elements like neodymium, excuse me, samarium. Uh, we do argon-argon dating. There's a whole suite of different systems, that uh, isotopic system, rubidium strontium system, a whole bunch of complex ones. There's still arguments over the dates of some of these, 
but a lot of people are clever enough to, to use you know, five systems at once, so a lot of the ages converge very well. And uh, yeah, it's basically isotope chemistry, and it's, it's an extension of what we already use to try and date earth rocks. Same techniques work. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Professor Ralph Harvey. Professor Harvey is Principal Investigator of the National Science Foundation's Antarctic Search for Meteorites, a 35-year-old project to mount annual expeditions to Antarctica. We've heard about the historical search for life on Mars and the modern search for flowing water. In our final segment, Dr. Harvey will tell us why the evidence from meteorites shows no signs of life on Mars. Now, back to Dr. Harvey. Here we are, summer of 96, and a group of scientists at NASA Johnson Space Center has declared they see signs of life in these carbonate weathering produced minerals in this rock. Um, the response of uh, the NASA headquarters was just about the opposite of what it should be. They decided that this rock was so valuable to science that they were going to have a moratorium on samples going out. It was so valuable they couldn't afford to lose any. Which meant that the only people who really got to double check this group's answers were people who already had the rock in hand. And I was one of them. So I spent about the next two years of my life trying to double check their evidence. That's what a good scientist does. So I'm going to talk about three main lines of their evidence. One of the first things they did was they said, those organics that the Viking lander couldn't find, we found them in this rock. And organics mean life. But organics don't mean life. Patricia told you that. Organics are everywhere. The distinction is that the oxygen that's fleeing dissociation of water in Mars's atmosphere destroys those organics. And the idea was that organics were somehow protected down in fissures of this rock. Now, this is not Allen Hills 8401. This is a different rock. What I want you to notice, though, is this crop of weathering minerals. These developed in the lab after we brought this rock back from Antarctica. And Allen Hills 8401 is an Antarctic meteorite. It sat in Antarctica for thousands of years. In truth, it is fully contaminated by the Earth. This is their trace of uh, the organics. They found a sensitive instrument detecting uh, thousands of molecules. I mean, very sensitive. It doesn't need zillions. It needs thousands. And the bars show different long chain organic. This is kind of a measure of their weight here. I don't want you to worry about the height of the bars because the height doesn't matter. It's a counting statistic. And these instruments are overly sensitive. They just see if it's there or not. If it sees 100 atoms or 1,000 atoms, doesn't matter. And what we find is that if we look at Antarctic ice and the organics that are clearly produced in Antarctica on meteorites, they match up very well with these. It's the same group of organics. The organics these people found are indistinguishable from terrestrial organics. This was later borne out, actually, with isotopic studies, that in terms of isotopics, they match the Earth's carbon-12 rich uh, conditions and not the carbon isotopes that we see in other Martian meteorites. Their second line of evidence was little perfect grains of an iron oxide mineral called magnetite. And we talked about the importance of iron before, uh, how quickly it, it gloms on to oxygen and vice versa. Organisms on Earth operating in an oxygen-rich environment can inadvertently poison themselves. Oxygen is so reactive. So one mechanism they came up with was hey, if I keep a few iron molecules around, I can throw the oxygen in there. And so some organisms on Earth have learned to build little grains of iron oxides that they can buffer their oxygen content with. It's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant adaptation, OK? Well, the NASA group said these perfect little octahedral facets are totally unlike non-biological magnetites, OK? And they said these carbonates have only these octahedral, octahedral magnetites, beautiful euhedral crystalline magnetites. Well, my colleagues and I saw immediately that that was just not the story. Certainly, there were beautiful little octahedrals, but there were also these things like ribbons. I hope you can imagine this is an octahedra right here, and one of the faces, let's imagine this face, has just continued to grow. This is a typical defect 
in a crystal that is growing with wildly out of equilibrium conditions. Okay? These defects are forbidden in an organism. The minute an organism can't control the iron oxygen reaction, it's no longer useful for it as a budget. And these were all over the place. That said, this kind of ribbon-like growth of magnetite is very common in high temperature environments. Okay, it's a way of, it's a reaction to the, the, the changing speed of the reactions to grow on one face instead of all eight of an octahedra. Okay, not only that, in our study of these magnetites, we saw that they could not possibly be a death assemblage. And by death assemblage, I mean organisms die, they're laying around in all kind of random patterns. That wasn't the case. The magnetites showed in almost every case a beautiful alignment with the shortest direction of the magnetite crystals. They had followed the rules of physical chemistry and the second law of thermodynamics in, as carbonate turned into iron oxide at high temperatures. It uh, followed the original crystallographic pattern. And in fact, you can kind of see it here in a few places. All these guys are kind of aligned, or most of them are aligned, and you can see this common angle with the carbonate behind it. That is, in fact, the shape of the carbonate, and this is the shape of the magnetite. This is called epitaxy, and it was rigorously obeyed in this rock, and that means it cannot be a death assemblage. Okay, this is the equivalent of stepping out in the fall and seeing that all the leaves have fallen in your yard on edge, all pointing north. Okay, it is not a death assemblage. And then finally, over the last few years, we've discovered you can make perfect crystals inorganically, piece of cake. So this magnetite thing has most mineralogists and science, planetary scientists like myself just say, you guys are dreaming. And yet this is the one line of evidence they keep harping on. Uh, we don't get it. The final bit of evidence is the most dramatic, the one that you probably uh, or captured the most people and had the potential to be uh, the smoking gun, if you will. It was pictures of things they said were fossilized bugs. Right away, microbiologists had a problem with this, primarily in terms of scale. Because the argument had been that these were free living bugs and they were living in the environment where the carbonate was. This is that big one you just saw here. This is actually the typical size that they said they saw. This, through the middle here, is a cross section of the very smallest free living organism that we know of on Earth. And by free living, I mean it's not a parasite. It's not a virus. It's not living off another living organism. It is swimming around, doing its thing, reacting with nature for its source of energy. Okay? These are way below the actual limits that biological chemistry, that metabolism can support on our planet. Patricia, I'm sure, told you that the chemistry of life is basically based on very weak solutions. Get too much of your active mechanisms in there, you burn up your cell. Don't get enough, the mechanisms don't go. Okay? These guys are so small, they can't fit in enough water to go with one molecule of RNA to make it work. Okay, they're just too small. Further complicating it or further reasons that very few people in the scientific community swallowed this was that we'd been down this path before. Twice before in history, people had seen critters, if you will, that they saw in meteorites. And, and typically it happened when we turned new instruments on the meteorites for the first time. People saw something they were curious about and they interpreted it as life. Later on, we learned these were all uh, st limonite stains, iron oxide stains on fractures in the rock. Another thing that's interesting just to date this, these are some of the first, on the left of each of these pairs, some of the first electron microscope images of any rock every, anywhere. And the guy doing the study, Bartholomew Nagy, uh, took the liberty that all biologists had used in t previous times and retouched the pictures a little bit to show you what was important. And so people would say, well, yeah, you see kind of a wormy thing, but do you see mitosis, cell division? Say, oh, yeah, here it is, right here. You know, that's his interpretation of this. Do you see the double cell wall? Oh, yeah, here it is, right here. You know, clarifying it by getting rid of all the dark gunk here to show you it really is. A, it was limonite stains. And in fact, 
A uh, few of the best pictures that Bartholomew Nagy has are of pine pollen from his lab in Minnesota. Well, during all this time, the folks at the Johnson Space Center's best defense on the bugs was to say, well, you're not using the same instruments we were. We're using instrument X. You're using instrument by another company. Your images aren't as good as ours. And my colleagues and I got so fed up with that that we went and found serial number two. They had serial number one. We got serial number two of the same instrument. We used the same standards. We used, took the pictures the same way. And this is what we saw. We could find worms, but we could only find them if we threw out about 99% of the field of view. The field of view on a larger scale showed us that they were actually the kind of uh, edges of curly Q plates. These curly Q plates are clay minerals. They are weathering minerals, and they are very, very much expected in a rock of this site type. In essence, my colleagues and I published a paper that was entitled, uh, Not Subtle at All, no fossils in Allen Hills 8401. And uh, the original NASA group retracted their claim immediately following that paper. They said, you're right, we're wrong. Uh, what they didn't admit to was the fact that they had to throw out 99% of their data to get a good picture of worms. Well, in summary, uh, there is no evidence for life on Mars right now, OK? If I wanted to find evidence for life on Mars, I would look for it in a reactive atmosphere. We spent a lot of time last time talking about how biology, metab metabolism, tends to produce waste products that are going to build up over time and change the chemistry of the planet. So naturally, you ask, well, what about that methane you mentioned? And further study has been done, and there is methane there. There is no question. And it changes with the seasons, just like the quote unquote, vegetation, OK? Is it being blown around by the winds of Mars? Certainly it is being blown around. That could be the seasonal change right there. The people that reported this talked about it showing up in the summer, didn't talk about what happens in the fall, that it blows away, OK? It is also extremely highly uh, it The methane is showing up above volcanoes, OK? There are volcanic provinces in a bunch of areas of Mars. We see no signs of volcanic activity in terms of lava flows and stuff on Mars right now. But this may be signs of internal heat, of leakage of internal gases. This methane is certainly possible to be a product of volcanic activity. It does not require biological activity, and that should not be our first guess at what is producing it. In fact, not only can volcanism produce it, but in the presence of CO2, if you mix hot volcanic rocks with water and CO2, guess what you get? You get methane. And you get some other organic materials, longer uh, chain organic materials. You don't need metabolism from Mars. So uh, to put it bluntly, and this, the, the next slide comes from a student's exam of about, uh, be almost 15 years ago. I think he summed it up beautifully. What you see in the Mars rocks is what you're looking for sometimes, OK? You have to be very, very careful, particularly, particularly and, and this, is, this is where a little bit of uh, society comes into this. The question of whether Mars has life is wrapped up in religion. It's wrapped up in the origins of humanity. It's, wrapped, it's not just a planetary science question. As planetary scientists, we may study it and want it to be purely an issue of science. But it escapes right away. And with the media the way it is today, with science fiction, one of the most popular genres, it is impossible for people not to speculate over any sign that could be interpreted as a sign of life. And then I promised to talk a little bit about the outer, where I might look in the solar system for life. I mean, in summary, I think if life developed on Mars, it would be inescapable. You know, I don't see, given the struggles that life had to go through on Earth, things like that snowball Earth that freezes the planet all the way to depth, and life still changes the atmosphere, changes how the crust behaves. 
utterly modifies the planet. I don't think, I cannot think of a scenario where life meekly rolls over and dies on Mars, that somehow Mars had life early on and it went away. How do you make it go away when it modifies its own environment so beautifully? I don't know how. Where I would look, though, is those outer satellites, Jupiter, Saturn. These are areas where the amount of sunlight falling is lower. These are bodies, Enceladus in particular, that are small. They have liquid oceans. We can tell from the geophysics of things. They are leaking atomic oxygen. They have little toruses of it. Astronomers, planetary astronomers, are very careful not to interpret that as signs of photosynthesis. Okay, good for them, and I'm glad that the public media hasn't quite caught on. But these are great places to look. And then finally, uh, in the interest of disclosure, I want to show you the Mars rover, that picture that NASA didn't want me to show you. <laughs> and with that, uh, we'll call it a day, and thank you. This lecture is part of the Origin Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins a partnership of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. It has been brought to you with the generous support of Richard Morrison and the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Media Vision, and WVIZ-PBS and 90.3 WCPN IdeaStream. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at www.case.com dot edu forward slash origins.